uh, we'll go ahead and get started with this. I can stay for the duration. So, All right. so you, you drew you drew the short straw. <laughs> well, I, uh, although we only have a few folks in the in the room, uh, we're going to continue on because uh, this is being recorded for uh, 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 posterity. Thank you. That that big word that means for a very long time. Um, so, um, for those of you who uh, um, in the early two thousands. Uh, there was a TV show called Lost, and there was always sort of a little dung, and the, they said previously on Lost. Well, dung previously on Transportation 101. Uh, we kind of ran through uh, the funding sources and the geography, and sort of the, the take-home lesson there is um, it really does matter where you're located because that determines what fund sources are available, who, who makes the decisions, um, and that sort of thing. Um, and where we sort of ran out of time was we were going to sort of get into why does it matter? So I think if I hit this button, um, we, we can move on to the next slide. And again, this is all in the sl slide deck that's available to everybody. But in 2014, the Texas Transportation Institute uh, d uh, did a um, sort of a cost analysis and they and they broke down sort of the cost of congestion. They they figured out, well, if you're stuck in traffic and they figured out how much per hour people were stuck in traffic and they figured out um, how much excess fuel was consumed and everything else. And for the Pikes Peak area, spent about an extra 35 hours in congestion that had, had we had uh, roads that uh, were more efficient, you would have gotten to where you were um, 35, uh, cumulative 35 hours faster. And so they figured out that is a cost of, that that cost each commuter uh, $772. So that's why an efficient transportation network matters. But that's only your time. Hopefully the next slides is the, um, um, kind of breaks down some of the other things. If we, if we, that's to the individual person. The other thing that matters about transportation is keeping up your network. And this is the um, uh, uh, can, uh, the preventive maintenance. Um, it, and it, it's 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 more cost effective if you take a positive, proactive sort of thing. If you redo your roads every five years or so, you're really sort of you're you're not getting the most bang bang for your buck. But as you start getting to ten, the cost per doing the rehab, uh, seven seven dollars a square yard, or uh, major rehab at seventy dollars a square yard, there's sort of you get to this this point where, all of a sudden, uh, you're you're paying you're you're paying more on an annual basis than had you just kept your roads up, um, on an annual basis. And the, the analogy I like to use because, oh, I don't know, like unicorn blood, I like analogies, is, is, is taking care of your house, right? If you paint your house every year, it looks beautiful, but you're, you're probably spending more time and money than you need to. But that being said, if you paint your house, what, every you know, three or five years, you're, you're doing the preventive maintenance, you're keeping the, the cracks and everything, and again, uh, I'm used to Arizona numbers, right? So I know snow is a little different, right? But you're keeping the cracks. If you sort of, and you're, and then you're out just like 50 bucks for, for some paint and, and stuff like that. And the time is minimal. But if you don't paint your house for 10 years, 15 years, all of a sudden, now when you go back to sort of keep it up, you're not only paying for the paint, but now you've got to replace some of the wood. You've got to sand down some of the wood. You've got to, you know, there's, there's a lot more maintenance that has to be done, right? Same sort of thing. If you keep a, a good seal coat on your roads so that the 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 water and the snow don't get into it, um, that is far cheaper over time than than cheaping out, ignoring your roads, letting them get potholes, letting them get destroyed because then you're into a full rehab. So uh, that's the little thing, the little uh, nugget there of information. Um, so earlier, was I seeing that? Slide right where it says like 17 years is the is the crossover point. Yeah, I think so. Uh, let me see if I can go back. I think I can. I think I can. Previous. Yep. I think about the yeah about the 17 year. 
And that kind of makes sense because if you look at when the, the when the feds give you money to do a transportation project, they say the functional life is about 20 years. So if the, if the project doesn't make it to that 20 years and you sort of abandon the project, the feds are going to come after you and say, hey, we want the, we want our money back because we gave you X amount of dollars. Um, so 17 years is, a, is, a, is about right. So again, that's where, where at that point, if you've ignored it that long, you're better off redoing it than trying to, to, to fix it. Um, and then earlier I gave you sort of the time stuck. Um, in transportation, again, back to the sort of the inefficient roads. Um, there's that. Uh, there's additional thing, and again, this is from the TripNet, and which is a, another sort of national folks. The TripNet does reports for all the different 50 states, so they'll redo every state so often. But you can see that this is just trying to say, as far as the vehicle operating costs, which is. Um, Things like uh, suspensions and I don't know, the cars still have CV joints. It seems like in Arizona, I was replacing a CV joint every time, like, like air cabin filter, right? Um, but uh, shocks, tires, your uh, your rims, that sort of thing. All A poor road condition just beats, beats up your car. And that's the sort of the point of this slide is there is a cost for your vehicle operating co cost, um, it redoes. It, it brings back that uh, congestion number again, um, and then safety. And if you've noticed that first slide I showed you, that was from 2014 data, and I forget what it said, like 720. Uh, this is a 2018 number, and you see it's up to 850 for congestion. But overall, wear and tear in your vehicle, being caught in congestion, and everything else, um, the average Colorado Springs resident. Um, is is has an extra uh, almost two thousand uh, dollars due to inefficient roads. Uh, Denver, it's a little bit more, um, and then other parts of the state, it's a, it's a little bit less. All right, so that was just sort of our little module on why it matters, why roads are important, because, and again. Up until a few years ago, right, our conversation was we don't have enough money for transportation. Our roads are falling apart. We have we have congestion. All of a sudden, somehow the narrative changed a few years ago where all of a sudden it was like roads are bad. If you build roads, um, all you do is is all they do is get filled up again. And that just causes greenhouse gas and everything else. Right. So somehow the, the narrative has changed. But I, I believe that some of the numbers still sort of very much if you get away from some of the rhetoric, um, a good road network and a good road race system, and that includes all modes, bike, pedestrian, uh, transit, um, is important for moving folks around and it pays for itself. Uh, so next is we're, we're next module we're going to move into is sort of the planning, and this is more specific to PPACG. Um, and more importantly, again, uh, within PPACG as the Council of Governments, you're either in the Central Front Range TPR or you're in uh, the uh, Pikes Peak MPO, um, which is the urbanized area as, as de designated by the census. So, and yes, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, I, I, I know that this is a, <laughs> is a, a, an item of contention, but again, the, that bound, the MPO boundary is based on that urbanized area. So uh, we're, we're, we move it where, where the numbers tell us we can move it to. So the good news is probably maybe the, the 2050 census or so, you'll, there'll be enough uh, growth in Eastern El Paso County. We can, we can jog and, and, and connect you by then, but yeah, well, I figured by then I'll be retired and long gone. <laughs> so, all right. So, but part of the NPO, we're required to do a, a long range transportation plan. And so the last one that we did that was adopted in um, 2020, in, in January 2020, was the 2045 Long Range Transportation Plan. So that plan, um, this is kind of some of the the uh, the outcomes of that plan. First, we sort of uh, figure out what our um, what our issues are, or what what are the things that we need to address. So we 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 touched on the population growth. So you see, there's a uh, uh, some cool graphics there that show how we're we're intended to grow to over a million folks by 2040. 
um, that we showed that what the employment growth would be, uh, how much freight would be coming through the region, uh, giving our, our our location on I-25, and then the overall sort of growth and vehicle miles traveled. Now that that little graphic there is again using the data that's available, um, the GHG rules and everything else. That's one of the things that they want to target. So if we take our, uh, so that as we're doing our next plan, um, we're going to do uh, what we can uh, to say, take that 6,000 or almost seven, seven, is that a billion? Enough commas? All right, seven billion vehicle miles traveled and reduce that, right? And that's that's the target there. So the idea is that we're going to comply with what they want us to do at the state level on vehicle miles traveled, but at the same time, um, still have an efficient transportation network that actually makes sense and um, accounts for the, the growth that we have here in El Paso County. Um, some of the numbers, uh, total estimated project needs. And to be clear, what we did is we said, hey, all of the jurisdictions within the NPO, and again, sorry, Mayor Pro Tem, it was within the NPO, we said, what are your projects, right? So they gave us their projects. Now, if they have one issue, um, but they have two different projects that could address it, like a, 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 a low cost solution and a high cost solution, they probably both brought both into the process. So that's just sort of a little disclaimer that that $6.8 billion was everything that any jurisdiction had on their books with it, any sort of comprehensive plan, any sort of major streets and routes plan or something like that. And that might not necessarily meant that they were planning on doing both, but they brought both in the process because if they couldn't get one, they wanted to get the other. So that 6.8 million isn't the total needs for the region um, uh, as a, a definitive number, but rather a 6.8 as a good guideline, as a good starting point. It's probably maybe just a little less than that, but not too terribly um, off base. The estimated uh, maintenance and operations cost, part of what the federal rules uh, dictate is there's a, a tenant that says, we don't want you building a whole bunch of new stuff and neglecting your old stuff. So you, you, before you start using federal dollars to build new infrastructure, you have to sort of show uh, that you're making a good faith effort to maintain what you already have, you know, maintain the system. So we've, asked, again, working with our jurisdictions, the maintenance and operations costs of about 3.8 billion. Um, um, we took the total needs and maintenance, came up with about 10.6 billion, our reasonably expected revenue for the region for the 20, till out to 2045. And that ex assumes an extension of the PPRTA um, out for the whole life of the uh, of the plan um, gave us about six billion dollars of reasonably expected. That gave us an unfunded cost of about four point six. I suspect as we do um, the next plan in 2050, which Danelle is going to take care of here shortly, which she'll tell you about it. But this number won't come out for another couple of years. Updated numbers on this for the 2050, but that number is going to go up, and uh, part of it is. While it will be nice, I shouldn't say nice, it, it, it would be expected that some of the bigger projects might come off because of GHG, right? Because we're limited on our capacity building projects. But that being said, we still have to move people around. So anything we sort of take off on the roadway side, we're gonna have to probably add more different other types of projects. And everything that we do um, is going to be a lot more expensive. We've seen with an inflation, hyperinflation here of 10% or whatever, um, we're going to get up. Our transportation dollars are not uh, keeping up with inflation. So we'll, I suspect we'll fall, fall further behind. But again, that's not up to me. I don't sort of decide what projects are in the big pot or the, the galaxy of projects. The, those projects get uh, brought by the jurisdictions. So it just depends on what they bring us. Uh, on what that number is going to be. But I suspect that $4.6 billion of unfunded needs is actually going to increase. Nope. Hey, John, how often is congestion calculated? Because that's an interesting question. If we can't build projects because of, of limitations, kind of artificial limitations for greenhouse gases, how, how fast do we 
how often are we going to recognize, okay, now we're, 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 our congestion is getting worse and worse and worse. So I think the best way to answer, answer that question is there's sort of, there's sort of two, two, two answers. From our point of view, congestion, we build a model as part of the long range planning process. And so what we do is we take the census data, we take the job data, and we take the, um, uh, uh, Oh, uh, the 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 growth data from the state demographer's office, right? And so we we figure out uh, a model of what things are going to do. We run a synthetic population um, through that, giving the the estimated uh, the estimated new jobs and and where the area of growths are going to be. And we sort of do that as an economic uh, an academic exercise, and we produce the model. And that's what a lot of the long range plan is based on. So. When you said how often do we calculate congestion, we calculate it with every plan. Right now, because we are in attainment, our plan is going to be done every five years. So we'll sort of have a new gauge on on congestion about every five years. The actual real answer, the real life answer, is nobody judges uh, congestion in real time. We can go out with. Um, uh, vehicle counters, those little pneumatic tubes mm -hmm. that are laying across the road, and we can have some um, um, some pretty high tech uh, equipment. CDOT has that does uh, uh, vehicle detection in motion. Um, I think they're like little pucks that they put in the roadway that actually do that, and they can they can give you the the average daily traffic. But even then, congestion is a yeah. um, exercise of how many vehicles there are and how much space there is, volume, volume over capacity ratio, and mm -hmm. that gets you the congestion. And anything over one, I think, is considered congestion. I, so, I, I don't want to slow you down on this one topic, but it seems like we could measure some of that now with with uh, the way, you know, you get reports on your phone about, yeah. you know, traffic slowdowns on all over the city. And curious, but again, I don't want to slow you down. Does this city or do other municipalities or other government organizations look at that data and use that as, uh, you know, now on powers, you used to be able to go from point A to point B at 4, 5 p.m. Right. in five minutes. Now it's taken the average telephone uh, 15 minutes. Uh, yes. So um, there's there's a company called Streetlight and actually PPACG has, has purchased a Streetlight license for the whole region. So it takes it takes that uh, Bluetooth data from your phone, and it it does exactly what you're saying. So we have all of that sort of real time data, and we're we're building that into the model. But again, there's the the difference between real life current day congestion versus what's going to be out there in 2050, and what projects that we need to have. Right. So there's those two. It's okay. I mean, say how do we measure congestion? There's two sort of things. There's the measured one that's the academic exercise out to 2050 and then today and like i said out in 2050 we make assumptions based on well we think this many people are going to work at home we think this we think that but then in reality what will happen is um you will have a a a a new development that all of a sudden everybody wants to go out to bass pro shop well when we did the first when we did a plan Bass Pro Shop wasn't there, so we figured there would be no cars. All of a sudden, Bass Pro Shop pops up. It's, it becomes a destination. Everybody wants to go there. So again, real life congestion with real things happening in real time is far different than modeled congestion. And, and again, not to get too pokey, but that's a little of what we were saying with what the problem was with the whole the GHG thing, right? They, they say, we want you to, we want you to figure out how to get rid of GHG in this academic, not real world, when in fact the real world does not necessarily mimic what we've assumed or estimated. So does that help? Yeah, it does. All right. All right. So we're we're rolling now. Huh? Well, I might sure. just uh, not not to derail this, but the city of Manitou is using that street light uh, or anticipates using it to kind of figure out some of our daily congestion problems. So here we are sleepy little Berg now at eight o'clock in the morning. We have uh, traffic jams, believe it or not. And it's not just because we have deer crossing the street. <laughs>
But yeah, and and the and I, I I would mention that the streetlight data was purchased for the for the three county region. So if there's if there's something in Green Mountain Falls that you're interested in, obviously you probably you don't have the staff capacity. But if you come and talk to Will, uh, we can we can help you sort of build a thing. Same with uh, uh, Callahan, you know, say hey, we really want to know how many people are are in this particular area at this particular. We can take the, the data. Is it yearly or two, two years? Do you remember? Yeah, well, the, the rolling data, they, they have like historic data. So there's historic data. So if there's a particular part of, of your uh, towns that you said, hey, we're really interested about what's happening in this particular area, just like Manitou's is doing, uh, we can run that for you. Can it derive speeds? I think. Uh, oh yes, speed. yeah. Because what okay. it does is, I'll, it, I'll send you a message because I would like to have estimated yeah. speeds. And we can, we can, we'll get you in touch with Will, and we can help you out. And normally for the bigger jurisdictions, we just provide the license, and they run their own queries, and it's unlimited. Obviously, you guys <laughs> don't have the staff, so we're we're, we're happy to help you out. Um, anyway, this was. Sorry, I got a little squirrel. Tangent, let's get back to the thing. This is just sort of that, those numbers I was given before in a different little graphic. So we'll just keep moving. Um, we talk about the different fundings that we have available. There's unrestricted where we actually have some sort of um, ability to move the money around and, and do what we wanna do with it. There is, um, that has, since, tw since we did the 2045 plan, that has obviously changed with SB 260 and and other of these state efforts, right? We'll be required to do certain things here and certain things there uh, to do it. So while it's technically unrestricted, it's unrestricted, although heavily guided uh, by these new state statutes. So that's just that's just being honest. Um, there are other things that are uh, restricted, like the maintenance and operations uh, that we, it gets set aside as well as the uh, transit restricted capital. Um, they come from FTA, the Federal Transit Administration. You can't spend it on anything other than um, the uh, transit improvements. So that's how we sort of uh, got into the uh, funding total there. Okay. All right, so now, you know, what's next? Um, at the statewide level, um, The, the state is required to do a, a state transportation plan. And the way they they do it here in, in Colorado, they're not required to give um, projects. They don't need to do a 30-year projects that would do. They talk about uh, priorities and things like that. So um, a few years back, uh, the state did their, um, and they adopted in 2020, they did the statewide plan where they did um, I think there's 65 counties in Colorado. They went to all 65 counties and they did straight fairs and they they did listening sessions. Um, and so they come back with like priorities and and other things. So if if you remember, and I know you guys were all listening so intently uh, back then, but if you remember to last month, I had said there's 15 TPRs across the state. Five of us are MPOs. So we sort of control our own process do our own thing. The other 10 transportation planning regions or TPRs like Central Front Range um, is uh, CDOT runs that process. So when CDOT comes to town to run that process, that's the opportunity to sort of hear, hey, this is what we want to do, what we want to do, what we don't want to do. Um, and they put those things into that statewide plan. So, so that's what's next is the next um, statewide plan is coming up and should get started in the next did they say at the last stack meeting but like in the next within the year right yes so so for central for callahan which is in central front range that's what you'll you'll have um uh cdot sort of running your process and then they'll come and ask you what your priorities are and stuff like that they will take down specific projects. So if you have projects that you want to have sort of on their list, they'll do that. 
but they don't have a fiscally constrained in plan, out of plan the way the MPOs do, because that's uh, part of the federal rules. So there will be a process coming up. And when we hear about that, we're going to make sure that you guys uh, know what's going on and anything we can do to help, we're, we're happy to do. For the area inside the MPO, then that's a sort of different process, which I think is the next slide. So this is my clever sense of humor, because we in the NPO business, every time there's a new plan, we have to come up with a catchy name and, and whatever. So I figured, well, we'll just take moving forward 2045 and just make it 2050. But I'm sure, but we're, we're, we're going to bring in um, some public involvement help. And so they'll probably have like your choice 2050 or how or, or mobility matters 2050 or something. It'll be a clever thing. But for now, since we don't have an official name, I like moving forward, remove 45, add 50. So, and with that, this, the next set of slides, Danelle's going to take over, um, kind of talks about what's going to happen here in the next, uh, I want to say two years, but it's really like next year and a half for us developing our 2050 plan, some of the requirements that the feds are, are looking for. But this is, um, again, the PPACG MPO versus the TPR, you've got that sort of, that, that different process. And now, what I talked about before with the CDAP process, now we're going to go into um, that long range plan. And with that, we'll tag out, tag out, tag out. I'll come in off the ropes. All right. Um, as John said, uh, we are kicking off our 2050 uh, long range transportation plan. Um, and I'm going to kind of be heading that up with a, a lot of. Um, guidance from John and some uh, some consultant help as well. Um, so as John mentioned, uh, the long range transportation plan has several federal and, and state requirements that go along with it. Uh, we have to extend the horizon out at least 20 years. Um, and, and generally PPACGs has uh, gone out 25 uh, years. So our plan that gets adopted in 2025 will go out to 2050. Um, we're reviewed uh, we review and update the plan every five years. Uh, we have to maintain fiscal constraints. So that's the difference between the state plan and, and the MPO's plan. Um, and that's what John was talking about with the uh, reasonably, um, the reasonable assumptions of revenue. So our project list that's uh, eventually going to get adopted by the board um, has to fit within that uh, assumption of revenue. Um, and then there's some other things. There's there's the greenhouse gas. Uh, there's some uh, Title VI and um, other compliance issues there. And then we coordinate pretty strongly with uh, CDOT, with the Federal Highway Administration, um, the Federal Transit Administration, and of course our uh, local jurisdictions. So this slide uh, just gives an overview of all of the component plans that kind of feed into our long range transportation plan. Uh, up at the top there, we have the congestion management process. Uh, that was uh, kind of our first step, um, and it was adopted by the board back in December. Uh, we also do a, a review of all of the local plans that might exist, whether that be a, a long range transportation plan or uh, like the corridors plan that uh, El Paso County is doing right now. So we always uh, pull in all of that information from the jurisdictions. Um, all of our long range transportation plan will be um, from the local jurisdictions to us, not outward. Uh, we will pull in the tri-county study to the extent that it, it fits within our MPO and uh, the intent of the, the long range transportation plan. Uh, we have a freight that should actually see a freight study um, that effort has actually been launched. Uh, Jason O'Brien is uh, heading that up for PPACG, and we have a consultant on board um, to move that through the process for us. Uh, we do have a transit plan and also a specialized human services plan um, that's uh, looking at those specialized uh, mobility options for uh, seniors and, and disabled uh, individuals and uh, those two plans are kind of uh, conducted 
in coordination with one another. Uh, MMT is kind of heading that up with uh, PPACG as well. Um, Laura Cruz, our mobility coordinator, is heavily involved with that specialized human services plan. Uh, and then up at the top, we have our active transportation plan, and that is uh, primarily non-motorized, so bicycle, pedestrian, and all of those kinds of, of modes of transportation. Uh, we actually have um, gotten some money from CDOT to, to do that active transportation plan. We're in the scoping phase right now. We're getting some, some feedback on our scope, and then we'll have the uh, request for proposals for a consultant uh, later this spring uh, to get that launched. Um, so these, this next slide is um, some roles for the jurisdictions in the creation of our long range transportation plan. And this was specifically uh, when we brought this to our uh, transportation advisory committee. These are things that we're going to be looking heavily to our TAC and to our, our jurisdictions to help us out with. Um, so there's coordination of the local plans again. Um, we will be uh, consulting very heavily. We've actually uh, put out an RFP for a consultant to come out and help with this. Um, but we'll be consulting very heavily with our, our local jurisdictions to create that regional forecast for uh, population growth and, and those kinds of things. Um, we, as John mentioned, will have the uh, local jurisdictions identify uh, the project needs and bring those project needs to us. Uh, they will also scrub the existing long range transportation plan. So what we did was um, take the 2045 project list and all of the projects in there that have not yet received any funding, those will roll forward into the new plan um, unless the jurisdictions go through and say that that they're no longer needed. Um, and that'll all be part of that call for projects. Um, new to this particular uh, transportation plan, uh, due to the greenhouse gas rule, uh, we will have every project identified by a five-year band uh, because we need to reach specific greenhouse gas um, targets. You're still here. <laughs> for for these five-year bands. So, um, They'll go from, you know, 2025, 2030, 2035, 2040, 2045. So each project will have an identified band. Um, there's no requirement that they get completed or funded within that time period, but it it's, uh, uh, assists with the planning process. Um, and then finally, our, our jurisdictions, our TAC and, and our board, of course, will be heavily involved in our project selection. Um, and we'll have uh, TAC workshops to to help with that process, uh, both for scoring and and for the the finalized project selection. And then we'll also, of course, have the jurisdictions uh, review the the transportation plan at various points in the uh, life cycle. So right now, our our next steps um, we are, as John mentioned, bringing on a consultant for uh, public outreach. Uh, they're going to assist us um, in establishing a uh, an advisory committee for the, the regional transportation plan. They're also going to be assisting us with our public engagement strategy and uh, conducting a, a public survey to help identify some of the, uh, the needs and, and priorities of uh, the community as a whole. And then this is our, our draft timeline. Um, so, as I said, the, the freight study is ongoing right now. Um, some of our other studies and plans will be starting up shortly. Um, at this point, we're really um, getting into the development of the plan with existing conditions, um, starting on some, some vision and goals and some um, financial plan stuff, that kind of thing. Uh, we also do have a um, consultant on board to help us uh, update our traffic demand model, um, which we've we've done uh, with some funding from DOLA that that uh, was provided to the MPOs. Uh, later on this year, toward the end of the year, early next year, that's when we're going to start doing really our our project lists in draft form and and starting the evaluation of those projects, uh, then finalizing those um, mid next year. 
uh, around the third quarter of next year, that's when we're going to have our the draft of our plan out for uh, public hearing, public review, those kinds of things. Um, and we're shooting for a, an adoption time of uh, late next year or January 2025. And then we just have one slide to talk a little bit about the public involvement process. Um, we will have that uh, consultant on board who's going to help us uh, kind of identify all of the places uh, we can have uh, public input. But uh, we anticipate public involvement at each step really in the in the process. So from vision to goals to um, producing the actual project list. Um, up through the final finalization of the document itself. And I think that's everything we have. Um, are there any questions on the long range transportation plan or or the timeline at this point? Not seeing any, thank you. Okay, anything else transportation related? Yep, Since that's the very last lesson. we do have John still in the room. <laughs> Okay, was that the last slide? I think this is the last. Yep. We didn't have anything online, did we? Okay. We got the check online. I got the easy part. You got the easy <laughs> part. <laughs> okay, if there's nothing else, then uh, we'll just call this to a close then. Thank okay. you very much. Well, yes, thank you very much. We appreciate it. This is, uh, I sometimes feel like I know far more about transportation than I ever hoped to know. And then I find out that I don't know nearly enough. So thank you. This is helpful. Yeah, well, we're a resource, so if anybody has any questions about anything that comes up, NPO or outside NPO, we're here to help. Absolutely. Appreciate that.